The term natural consequences has been one of the most simultaneously freeing and terrifying phrases that I've ever heard, especially as a parent. Natural consequences is a phrase that refers to the after effects of our decisions. After effects that aren't necessarily punishments, not something that we impose, but that happen as a direct result of our choices. If we touch the hot stove, we will get burned. If we put our finger in an electric socket, we will get electrocuted. If we eat Oreos that are not the original flavor, we will be disappointed. <laughs> These are facts. I've tried to warn you. A little extra effort or listening to my advice that flavored Oreos are just not worth it. Who booed? <laughs> Husband. <laughs> Natural consequences can also be terrifying. And again, if you are a parent, you know this. Learning from experience in high stakes situations like getting behind the wheel intoxicated, standing too close to the edge of a cliff, playing with fire. The natural consequences could result in something much more serious, like hurting ourselves or hurting someone else, sometimes even death. Those natural consequences are ones we try really hard to avoid. We freak out when our kids run into traffic and maybe say words we were not supposed to say to our children because we don't want them to get hurt. They make us hypervigilant about our choices and the choices that we love, the choices that ours, our loved ones make. Sometimes we get away with these choices without getting hurt, but when we don't, the cost can be insurmountable. In today's text that we read today, we're continuing to travel with the Israelites. I'm so glad Zach explained about this the story of origins, this, these beginnings. Because this tribe of people were on the move. They hadn't had a land that was their own. They were set apart by God to be God's people and to be a blessing to the nations. Last week we met them in the wilderness when they were on their way out of Egypt, when they were on the way to the promised land, and they had not yet figured out who they were together. They were being led by Moses, and God called them into covenantal relationship, inviting them into a relationship sealed with promises and commitments to fidelity, just like the Ten Commandments and all 600 others. It ordered their life together. It's how they knew how to be with God and to be with one another. It's how they survived. This week, we move forward a couple generations. So Moses is gone. His people were gone, but the next generation, the next couple generations, are in the promised land. They're being led by Moses' successor, Joshua, a strong warrior and military leader who had led his people into finding and making a home in new lands. Joshua is now an old man. He's been leading for decades. And we greet him once again, inviting the Israelites to renew their covenant with God. So generations passed, the original covenant that was made. Now, the book of Joshua is a tough one for many. If you were, if you were listening and reading this, it sounds horrendous. <laughs> people of conquest taking lands from other people. But when we see it in the light of the journey of an enslaved people, people who haven't had a home, we see in this book a significant part of a bigger story. Their story of journeying, journeying with a covenantal God through their flight out of domination by a people into a life of freedom with a God 
who fought for them, who had their best in mind, who through their eyes provided victory in battles and made a way time and time again for them to find home. As a person who just moved, finding home is something I've been longing for for months. If you've been away from home, you know what that feels like. But they stray. They assimilate into the culture that's around them. They worship God, but also a little God here on the side. They don't just serve God, they serve God plus. (laughs) Even though God desired their entire fidelity. Because covenantal relationships are relationships. They're committed relationships bound together with agreed upon boundaries. So at this point in the story, Joshua's trying to say, come back. (laughs) Remember what we promised. Remember what God has done for us. And he recalls their history together, which we read today. And Deb, you nailed every single one of those names. Well done. (laughs) He recalls God's faithfulness to them and reminds them once again to choose. Make a choice. Be faithful to your covenant or go and attach yourself somewhere else. Just don't try to do both. Don't try to have both. And if you decide to break the covenant, if you try to do both, there will be natural consequences. If you keep reading a couple more verses, you, could, you would hear that the people immediately respond, absolutely, why wouldn't we dedicate ourselves to God entirely? We would be foolish to forsake the God who has done so much for us. And I love his response so much. I wanted to show you a video of Joshua's response. Oh, okay. It's amazing that we recovered this video um, this many years later. Proverbs. If I may digress for a moment from my prepared message, I mean it when I say to you, you guys, sometimes you're bad. Don't be jerks. You're supposed to be good! I'm in my office every day, and somebody comes in, and they're like, hey, whoops, my like, don't! Dan, what is your deal? If anybody doesn't know, Dan is the worst. I took a vow to not say who was the worst, but it's Dan. You guys are making me look bad in front of God. What's that? Oh, look, it's Jesus. And he said, stop it. The word of the Lord. (laughs) Okay, so that might have been one of Joshua's ancestors and not actually Joshua, but you get the drift, right? You say you're going to do the right things, but you're not going to. 
You're not going to stay true. And he was not wrong. The Israelites did keep straying. As a matter of fact, if you read the rest of the Bible, that's how the story always goes, isn't it? God is faithful and calls us to faithfulness. And we say we will, especially on the big moments, the big days. And we even mean it, I think. And sometimes we even do good for a while. But slowly, and sometimes not so slowly, we fall back into those old patterns. Things get hard, and we turn back to those old comforts. Or things are really good, and we completely forgot who got us there. We forget the, for the giver of our gifts. We lose sight of our need and our dependency, and we chase after the high that those comforts provide. This pattern is repeated time and time again in the history of God's people as we read it in the Bible, and it continues in our story today. When looked at it in this light, <laughs> like Joshua, it feels a little bit more like, I'm never going to get this right. I'm never going to be okay before God. My situation is completely hopeless. Why even try? But because God is a covenantal God and not a God we have to prove ourselves to, there is always hope. Our scriptures reflect this time and time again. God remaining faithful us humans starting off well, getting off track, sometimes way off track, and God calls us back. When we decide to go our own way, God allows us to suffer the natural consequences. Like a good parent, I guess. But also, God always calls us back, every time. No matter how far off course we have gone, no matter how many doubts we have, no, many, no matter how many times we have done the horrible thing that we can't just seem to knock, there's always an invitation back. God always says, let's begin again. The love isn't taken away ever. From the outside looking in, we might think that's foolish, it might be foolish to, to keep working with people who just keep doing the same thing over and over again. But God does and always has. People who have do, done some horrendous things. I imagine we're going to read from the book of Judges next, in the next couple weeks. It's really bad. It's like a horror story. Like the worst that humanity could ever be. And still, God says, let's begin again. Let's begin again. Come back. Keep coming back to me. I love you. And I think God knows that that's the kind of love that helps us to keep growing, that helps us to keep learning. It helps us to remember that change is possible, even when we think we have done the worst. And God has always been committed to seeing us through. Our gospel text from, um, from Matthew talks about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. When he, too, was, was tempted to things that Satan thought Satan could offer. <laughs> if you aren't familiar with Jesus' trajectory, he gets baptized, and immediately he's sent out into the wilderness. He fasts for like 40 days. He's by himself. He's tired. He is weak. And it's in that moment that Satan comes to tempt him. And in this third temptation that we read today, he offers, he offers Jesus the temptation to be given everything he could ever want. Takes him up to a mountain and shows him 
beautiful, beautiful land and says, I could give this to you. You could be king over all of this. All you need to do is choose to follow me. And Jesus, famished and tired, leans into his holy scriptures and responds with a resounding no. That he was called to worship and serve God only. And the evil one flees. And I think so much of that story is to show us that it is possible. To show us how to do it. To show us that God loved us so much, took on flesh and showed us how to do it. And after he withstands that temptation, when he's tired and exhausted, and it would have been really great to have that land, God sends angels to comfort him in the wilderness to restore him to health. Joshua's question here is always the question that is posed to us. Who are you going to serve? On what foundation are you going to base your life and your life decisions upon? When we sang that song about all the places we can put our trust, they all fall flat. None of them are satisfactory, right? I wish they were. I wish we could trust in our politicians to make the right decisions all the time. I wish we could we could depend on our own strength. I wish we could depend on the strength of other people who are strong when we're not. But they all fall short. The question is the same. And it can help us to reorient our gaze because these were God's people. They've been following him for generations. They know They know the covenant. Sometimes we just need to be reminded to be called back, to begin again. We're constantly being called back. The door is always open, even when we think we have gone too far. Even when we have made huge mistakes or we think that what we have done is unforgivable or that there's no hope. As long as there is air in our lungs, God is always calling us back. Always reminding us that it's not too late. You may see an unpassable mountain, but we can pass it together, God says. And I'm so thankful for these stories and scriptures, especially when I'm at my worst. Because I know I'm not alone. I know there are faithful people who have gone before me, who have been messed up, (laughs) maybe more than me, which is really comforting, but who have messed up and God still said, come. Begin again. Let's do this together. They remind us that God has always been in the business of rescuing, walking with, and redeeming people who just can't seem to get it together. So in a couple moments, we're going to take this holy meal together that we call Holy Communion, where we remember the story of our ancestors, imperfect friends of Jesus who gathered around people, people who were going to deny him, who were going to hide in his time of need, who were going to fall asleep when he was crying and praying in the garden. They sat around a table and they received sustenance from God in human form. Every time we take this meal together, it reminds us who we are and who God is. And that God is calling us back to covenantal love every time. So before we move to this meal, let's take a moment and sit with that invitation. An invitation to covenantal love. Let's begin again. You are my beloved. Come, begin again.